to Facebook uh, so that we can get some additional people listening in too. So I'm going to pull up a deal right now. If you guys can just bear with me for a second. All right, so I'm gonna pull up 410 Central Street in Acton. All right, guys, so let me just pull up. Um, this is the property that we're gonna be analyzing. This is a property that I closed on. I just wanna see when I actually closed on this property. It was very recently. Um, by the way, every single thing that I do pretty much is stored in Dropbox. So we are 100% um, paper free and everything is done and stored in Dropbox. So I just wanna see roughly you know, what the basis of this is. So the HUD purchase, just to give you guys the date, the time frame, all that kind of stuff. Um, we purchased this property in, where is this? All right, so literally on Halloween, October 31st, 2017, two weeks ago. And I'm gonna walk you through also where this deal came from and the specifics about it. Okay, P-R-O-C-Y. All right, guys, so this lead came in August 29th, right? And the person was asking 340,000. Um, and this is just how like all of the leads come through for us. So they filled out a form online, the property was vacant. We talked to them. Uh, Mila is the agent in my office who ended up going out, ended up meeting with the customer, et cetera. After every single one of my agents goes out and meets with the customer, they fill out one of these one page sheets. And it basically just gives us all of the basic information. And I'm gonna show you guys um, what this looks like. And this is just so that I know what happened on these face-to-face -face appointments. So the majority of the appointments that we go on, that we meet with face-to-face -face, do not turn into an investment deal. The majority of them end up having what we call listing potential because the person either needs or wants more than what my investment offer ends up being. And because we have a 175 person real estate brokerage, we have the ability um, to list their homes if it makes sense. So after Mila, who went out on this property, um, after she went out, met with a seller, she's required by me to fill out one of these forms. And it just has all the basic information, the name of the seller, the, the um, city, the phone number, the address, the type of property, number of units, beds, baths. And the important things that I want to look at is what type of seller is it, right? Do they want to sell to an investor? Do they want to list? Do they just want retail pricing without listing? Or are they just curious, right? And then they put the outcome of the appointment, whether or not it's an investment deal, whether or not um, it should be shared with a group, right? Outcome of the appointment was an, an accepted offer, a counter offer, considering offer, right? So all of these things are things that we require our agents to fill out in order for me to get a better idea of whether or not this is something that essentially should get on my radar, because we go on over 100 face-to-face -face seller, appointment, uh, seller appointments at a week in the Boston office. So these forms will come through and then these forms um, I'll take a quick look at. And for the majority of them, because they're only listing potential only and they don't have investment potential, for the most part, I'm just going to back off and I'm going to say, you know, I don't really need to follow up with this one anymore. 
right? So the information that came through on this one, she thought that um, the person wanted top dollar without listing. And she believed um, when she went out there that this property actually just had listing potential. She did not think that this was going to end up being an investment deal, which for those of you who are in my program and you're currently working leads, you just never, ever know, right? So Mila is somebody who's been with me for a couple of years now. She's probably gone on, you know, 100 or 200 face-to-face -face appointments, and she still misanalyzed this. She still thought that this person was not going to sell to an investor, and she thought that they were more likely going to list. So it's just really critical that if you are working leads and if you're going out meeting sellers face-to-face -face, that you just never, you just never know. You can't really prejudge it 100%. And so when she went out there, the, the seller's asking price was $349. Time frame to sell was zero to three months, fair condition, and they were downsizing, right? So that's all the basic information. So actually, when I see this, in my head, I'm thinking it's probably not even one that makes sense for me to really even think too much about or follow up with or anything like that. Um, and I'm just going to go back through the file just to see the progression of, of how this ended up happening. So um, so yeah, so she put some notes in here. Let's see. She went on the appointment August. The lead came in August 29th. She went out on the appointment on August 30th. Um, she offered 269. They have to fi fix the septic if they want to get that price. Her brother-in-law is a seller. Um, will call me on Tuesday or Wednesday, right? So at that point, again, she thought that it was definitely going to be more of a listing. Okay. Offer is too low for them. They're thinking about an investor open house, basically an off-market open house, hoping that we can get them more money, right? She sent them listing docs to review on September 8th. So a week after she ended up going out to meet with them, she sent them listing docs thinking that they were going to list. And then three days later, they ended up taking our offer, right? So they wanted, um, we ended up first starting at 269 but once we found out that the septic was actually broken, um, we actually lowered our offer to 249. And look, they took an offer that was $90,000 less than their asking price, right? So you always have to, again, keep that in mind that, you know, somebody fills out a form, they say they want a ton of money. It's very, very, very common um, for the person then to take a lower offer. So just keep that in mind. Just don't make any assumptions. But now I'm going to actually get into like the deal analysis and how we review deals and how we think about deals. So um, for those of you who haven't seen one of these forms, for every single appointment that we go on, I have somebody that works full time that does like a, a 30 to 40 page CMA report on all of the face to faces that we go out on. So this face-to-face -face appointment uh, analysis is actually what I review. So this is the actually my main role in my investment business as of today is to review the 15 to 25 of these that come in on a day-to-day -day basis. So for every appointment that gets, that gets booked, we get one of these, these forms. And I've just got to, my computer is going slow. So I've got to refresh this here. But essentially what ends up happening and, you know, let me just see if I can get this back because this is going crazy, crazy slow now. So what ends up happening is that every day I get 15 or 20 of these sent to me in a file and then I will review the file to make a determination on whether or not I agree with the pricing. Let me just see if I can pull this up though. All right, cool. So I think like we said, this lead came in, uh, I believe it was August 29th and then the appointment day and time was August 30th, right? So on August 29th, when the appointment was booked, I'll get a sheet like this. And it'll show the address of the property, 410 Central Street in Acton, the zip code. Um, it'll be a single family. We run, so all of these, this first page is basically a summary of how we analyze the deals. 
these are all the different data points that we use. And some people will ask me like, do you use Zillow? Do you use MLS? Do you use the assess value? Do you, you know, look at a quarter mile radius or a half mile radius? And the answer is that we actually look at a lot of different things and we don't believe that one specific data point is the right answer. We, we know kind of the, the, um, the basics on each one of them. Like for example, in the Boston market, and this will be different depending upon where you actually geographically live. But in the Boston market right now, we know, for example, that the assessed value is typically a little bit on the low side. But we like to still look at the assessed value because we like to see how it actually relates to the other numbers. So I'm gonna walk you guys through um, some of the numbers, um, some of the pictures, basically everything that we have on this to help us determine what our offer was gonna end up being. But the first page of this, and this one was actually a 50 page report, um, is the summary of all of the numbers. And then everything behind this, so the, the, the next 49 pages are basically the, the backup, right? How do we come up with each of these individual numbers? And I review these reports typically in a five to six minute uh, time frame, And then I'll either approve the number or I will make an adjustment depending upon where I feel the value truly is on a property. So for example, right? So these are all the, the main numbers, but behind here is all of the data. All right, so this is just a Google street scene. And what a Google street scene does for me personally is it gives me an idea of the exterior of the property. And it also gives me an idea sometimes of the actual street. So this is just a, a screenshot of the actual house from Google. Google in most cities is amazingly accurate. So when I look at this picture, I know a few things. The first thing I know is that this is a smaller house. It's a ranch. It's a simple, simple property. Um, it's in decent condition from the exterior, right? So I, I know just from looking at this that even if the property is in poor condition on the interior, this is not going to be a massive, massive renovation because it's small. It's one level. It's a simple property, Um typically we'll even know roughly speaking, like what the age of the property is just by looking at it. And I would guess, and I, you know, I know my market fairly well. I would guess that this property was probably built anywhere between the 1950s and the 1960s, which for Massachusetts actually isn't considered that old. And obviously for any one individual's particular market, you just need to know, you know, like what's typical and what's common. And I'm sorry, my computer keeps freezing up. I've got to, all right, so that was the Google image. The second thing that we're going to look at is public record. The thing to consider about public record anytime you're looking at public record is in many cases, it's not 100% accurate. So it is very common that there can be an extra bedroom or an extra living space, or there could be a basement. So again, we're using the public record just to get a basis on some of the, the specific information that we need Again, not using any one particular data point, right? So like I said, just from looking at the picture, my guess was that that property was built somewhere in the 50s or 60s. And we can confirm that right here by looking at this public record report, which shows that the property was actually built in 1968. And again, this is just something that you will gain with experience. You'll know based on the age of the property, typically speaking, how much of a renovation it could potentially need. Um, and Massachusetts in general, properties were built anywhere from 1880 to 1930. So when I get something that's 1968 in a ranch, I'm thinking that this is going to be a fairly easy job. And I know that there's some people that are on the line here where a property in 1968 in your market would be considered really old and it might be a bigger renovation. So you've just got to keep that in mind. But public record will tell you, typically speaking, um, the square footage, as you can see here, 1144, the style of the house is a ranch, three bedrooms, one full, uh, one bath, one full bath, one half bath, all that good stuff. And then I'm going to look at the pricing history. 
Because I want to see if the property sold anytime within the past 10 years, I want to get a good indication as to where that price point was. Because again, based on what year it sold, we can get some indication as to what the price will be today based on how much properties have come up in that period of time. So unfortunately in this one, this the last sale happened in 1978. So it doesn't give us any indication at all as to where the pricing might be. But for example, say that this property sold in 2014, which would be three years ago as of right now, we would know that almost without a doubt that property would be up in value. Or if the property sold in 2005 at the height of the market, 2004, 2005, 2006, we might be around the same. So again, it's just knowing your market and using these data points to make a determination of the value. Like I mentioned, we do use assess value just to get a really baseline level. Um, assess value is not something that you want to, to use 100%. It's more, it's kind of along the lines of when did the property sell last? So again, we know if a property sold two years ago, it's probably worth more today. We know in general that the assessed value in Massachusetts tends to be a little bit low. So we know roughly speaking that 325 is going to be definitely lower than what the value of this property is going to be, especially fully renovated. The next data point is Zillow. And people go crazy about how inaccurate Zillow is. But I would really, really like to hear from anybody who's either listening or just in general where you can get a better valuation of a home within 10 seconds. So Zillow, as we know, it's not 100% accurate. It's a data point. Um, but the reality of the situation is if you need to figure out, roughly speaking, what the value of a home is, and you only have 10 seconds, Zillow is the best place. It's still, in most cases, a fairly accurate number. And so what you see here on Zillow is that these people actually had this property listed for sale by owner at 394,069. And so if you remember just from going in the beginning of this, so they must have tried to list it on their own for 394. And then they, they fill out a form on my website saying that they wanted 340. And in reality, we ended up buying this property, I think it was for 240. So this is like almost $150,000 off what the person initially asked for, right? So you just keep that in mind anytime that you're going out and somebody gives you a super high price. Yeah, and they, they had here sold as is condition. But the bottom line here on Zillow is that Zillow tends to be pretty accurate in terms of an after repair value. Um, what we're seeing in, in the Boston market is that typically speaking, the Zillow value tends to be a little bit lower than the after repair value. But again, we, we, don't, we, we only are looking at this just to get a really general sense of what the property might be worth. We're not using this to determine the actual value or the actual offer. So we see here, right, that, you know, again, based on my analysis, Zillow came in at 394. I'm thinking, roughly speaking, that our property is going to sell for a little bit over four fully renovated. The next thing that we look at are what we call retail comps. And retail comps are meaning what would this property sell for if it was listed on the MLS today in average condition, okay? And that's important, especially if you're gonna be doing light renovations, like, like we're trying to do in a lot of cases. So we're trying to see what would this property be worth if it was a five or six or seven out of 10 condition. By the way, for those of you who are listening, does this all make sense? I just want to stop for, for one second and just ask if, if anyone has any questions so far. And I'll pause for a second. And if not, I'm going to continue on. All right. Looks like we're good to go. If you guys do have any questions as we're going along, just type them right in. Um, I must be just making that much sense, which is good. So, um, but if you, if you do need clarification on anything, just let me know. So again, what we're going to look at, oh, actually we do have a question. All right. So Manny asked, are these reports complete, completed manually or is the process automated with software? Man, I wish this could be automated with software. Um, this is done manually, right? And we're pulling from a lot of different places. So like, for example, Zillow could probably be pulled automatically public record might be able to be pulled automatically. 
But what we're looking at next, the next four things that we're going to look at are all things that 100% need to be pulled on, uh, manually because they actually take some human involvement. And the reality is, is like you can make offers based on automated valuations. But if you really, really want to get the numbers right, you've got to spend a little bit of additional time because there is no, there is no automated system out there that will make the adjustments necessary. And we'll start to, to go through some of those adjustments that I'm talking about uh, for, for this particular deal. But um, you, don't, you don't really want to use any sort of automated valuation unless you're going to go super low on your offer. But the problem with going super low on your offer in this market is typically speaking, you're going to get overbid, right? So what we find ourselves doing, instead of saying, what's the lowest offer that we can make? We're actually going in it saying, what's the highest offer we can make, right? The highest offer we can make with a really good profit margin. So we don't want to use, let's just say in this example, we went by Zillow and we said, okay, you know, based on Zillow, we feel that the property's worth 394,000, which I think was the Zestimate. But the property is really worth 420 as an after repair value. We don't want to make an offer that's $25,000 lower and get outbid and lose the deal. So there, in my opinion, and you know, people will tell you different stuff. In my opinion, there's, there's always a, an offer that's too high, right? Where you're not going to make enough money. You've got to make a certain profit margin on every deal. But I also strongly believe that there's an offer that's too low because if you're offering too low, you're not going to get anything accepted. And in this market, you really have to be conscious of both because we're in a period of time right now where property values are probably more likely to go down over the next couple of years than up. So you definitely don't want to overpay and take that market risk. And on the other hand, you want to make sure that your offers aren't super low because the market is so competitive that you'll probably never do a deal. Okay. So these retail comps are what we believe, and these are manually pulled from the MLS system, the local MLS system. And we are licensed real estate agents. For those of you who are not licensed real estate agents, man, it's such a no brainer to get your real estate license. There's really no excuse for you not to get it. If you're going to be a real estate investor, um, there's so much data that you can pull. It's, it's definitely worth it. So again, we're, we're looking at the retail comps where our property might sell with the five or six or maybe seven out of 10 condition. And if you remember from the first picture, and let me see, I'm kind of afraid to go back because my, my computer was going so slow. But if you remember from the first picture, this looks very similar. It's also a three, uh, three bedroom. It's also a ranch. It's a, it's a one bath, right? And so the purpose of, of this comp is to say, what would it sell for um, in a five or six or seven out of 10 condition? And for me, I'm just going to verify that the person who pulled these comps for me did a good job and they did. So I'm looking at this property, right? This property has not been fully renovated. This is not an after repair value comp. This is just a pretty much a moving condition property that could use some, some cosmetic work, but livable. Right, so this this does fit the mold of the retail comp, and again, I think that was at you know three sixty seven or something like that. The next one that came up here again looks like a similar property. It's a ranch, three bed, one bath. Um, I'm just taking a quick look at these pictures. See, all right, so this one is not a good retail comp, and and again, I. I'm reviewing this for the second time. The first time I reviewed this, I used this to make my offer, but now. As I'm kind of going through with all of you, I'm actually doing a more detailed analysis than I did when we actually bought the property, because usually I spend five or six minutes on these. So for this one, they pulled a property that looks similar. It's a, it's a three bed, one bath, but this particular property is not a good retail comp. So the person who did this report actually messed up. And if you can see in the disclosures here, home being sold as is condition, right? So this isn't a retail comp. This is actually a good comp to determine whether or not maybe I got a good value, right? So this home is being sold as is. Title V failed. And Title V, for those of you um, in Massachusetts, you've got to get a, a passing septic system to sell the property. This means that the septic system failed. 
And a septic system in my area can cost you anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars. So it's a big, big deal when the septic system failed, and that's why this one sold so low. So for me, I wouldn't say I would throw out this comp. I would use it like all the other data points, but I would use it in a way like this might be close to what my offer should be because somebody else, probably another investor bought this property to, to fix and flip. So other than that though, well, let's just see what the pictures look like on this one. You know, I'm going to see if I can download this. I think it might run a little bit better if I actually have this open as a PDF. Let's see if this works a little bit better. Oh, yeah. All right. Much smoother. I should have done that to begin with. Sorry, guys. I think that was just pulling because I'm on this webinar here and that was the other one was pulling from Dropbox, which is also connected to the internet. So this is just directly on my computer. All right. So this one at 310. All right. So yeah, so I see where they messed up here. Like this property is probably a five or six out of 10 condition. So it's, it's, it's good for a retail comp in terms of the condition, but because the septic failed, it had to sell to an investor. So our septic failed, right? The septic failed on the property that we are actually purchasing. And so this is probably a better comp to say, what's, what's an offer that we should make? All right, so those are, those are just retail comps. Now, these are the comps that are really, really more important. So these are, are what we call the after repair value comps. And these are, these are the comps of the property. What is the property worth after the property is fully renovated, right? And this is the, the number that we use to calculate our offer. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the typical formula that investors use, I'm gonna throw it up here. Um, what we do is we take the after repair value times 70% minus repairs, okay? So in this case, let's just say, before even reviewing these comps, let's just say that this is right and the after repair value is 455. We would multiply that by 70% to get to 318. And I'm just going to throw in a random number here of $60,000 for a budget to get us to 258. Okay. So that's a rough analysis. And I'm going to review that number again, as we're kind of going along. But first I want to verify, are these after repair value comps accurate? So the first thing I see here is this is also a ranch. It's a three bedroom. It's a one bath. I think ours is uh, a one full bath and one half bath. So ours is a little bit better in that. What I don't like about this comp, this is 16, 16 square feet. Our, our property was, I think it was 1100. It was definitely not 16, 16. There is 568 square feet in the lower level. So most likely what this property is, it's probably the same exact type of ranch that, that we have, the, the exact, um, an exact comparable, but they probably finished the basement. So we're going to take just a look, see if we can get a, some pictures of the exterior to see if it's a very similar property. The other thing we want to note is how did this property sell? So on April 6th, it was listed for 435. Four days later, it went under agreement, contingent um, to under agreement, and then it sold very quickly. And it sold for $20,000 over asking, right? So one thing I do know, again, this is just local market information. This area is a hot area, Acton. So it's not surprising that the property went over. So I'm looking at the style of this house. Um, this, this property has a garage, all right? So, 
So I don't really love this as an after repair. I feel like this after repair is actually a little bit high. These pictures, I mean, this is exactly what the interior of ours is going to look like. We do top quality work. It's going to look great. But this has a garage. This has that 500 square feet or so in the basement. So I'm thinking that our after repair value isn't actually going to be quite this high. Other than that, though, all of these pictures look exactly the same. They look exactly like what my property would look like. Yeah, see, and here's the, the square footage. You can see that this is the finished basement. We typically don't finish basements. We find that the amount of value it adds is not huge. And it usually elongates the process of our renovation. And we, we don't get a good return bang for our buck in most areas. So we, te we tend to not do it. And we definitely won't be doing it on this particular project. So nice backyard, nice level lot. Okay. So that one sold at the 455 mark. Again, I'm feeling like our property won't sell that high, but let's look at the second comp here. Okay. Again, this property again is a little bit bigger than ours. And when you're going into small square footage, a couple hundred square feet makes a big difference. So if this was a 3,000 square foot property and we were using a comp that maybe is 3,300 square feet, there would be essentially no differential, right? When you're at that big of a property, 10% plus or minus is not a big deal. But our subject property, I think is 1,100 square feet and this is 1,400 square feet. So this one is a little bit bigger and I think that must be a garage. So again, I'm thinking that this property is going to be a little bit higher. One, one thing to keep in mind when you are running any comps, it's very difficult to get a complete apples to apples comparison. So while I'm saying that the person who ran these might have made a couple of mistakes, I may, if, if I were to go into my MLS right now and run all these comps myself and try to find a perfect comp, the reality is, is that I might not be able to find anything better. Like these may have been the best available comps for what we're using, which is why you can never use one data point and why you have to look at a lot of different pieces of data. So what do we know so far? So we know so far, I'm just gonna put a couple of notes here, right? What we know for sure, um, our investment purchase was sold for 300K. That needed a septic. A property that was better than ours sold for 455. Zillow value was 394. Okay. Retail property sold at let me just go back here to see what that retail home sold for. The one that was not, that did not need a septic. So this one sold for 367. And this one's a really, really good one because it, it does have that a thousand square feet, right? All right. So retail sold for 367. I'm actually going to organize these just so it makes a little bit more logical sense. Okay, so the low level mark, so the investment deal sold for 300, retail sold for 367. Property that was better than ours sold at, at 455, the Zillow value was 394. So I feel like, so this is why for me personally, I feel like I only need to spend five minutes on this stuff because if you look at this really quickly, like what do we know? We know a hundred percent for certain our property is going to sell for more than 367. I mean, that property was a five or six out of 10 condition. Ours is going to be much, much nicer. We also know that our property is not going to sell for 455. That property had more square footage. It had a garage. The Zillow value, which tends to be a little bit lower than retail sold for 394 right? Uh, uh, it's, it's listed for 394. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, no doubt the Zillow value is going to be over 400, right? I mean, the, the actual resale for ours is going to be over 400. More likely it's going to be in the 420 to 430 range. 
And the reality is, if you get a good enough deal, that's really all you need to know. So let's just, and I'm going to continue on with this, but let's just run those numbers. Let's just say ours is worth 425, which if I had to bet, I think ours will sell for a little bit more than this, but 425 times the 70%. Now let's subtract out a $60,000 budget gets us to 237.5. And what do we pay for that? I think we paid 240, right? So we were like literally right on the right on the money in terms of like what we needed to pay. But let's go back here. Let's continue on with this analysis. Guys, whatever questions you have, just type them in. Um, I don't know if I'm going too fast, too slow, if this stuff is fully making sense. So um, give me some feedback on whether or not this stuff is kind of making sense. But you're kind of putting, you know, the pieces of a puzzle together and then making a determination from there of what your valuation sh should be. So this one that sold for 485, like we already saw one that sold for 455, which I thought was too high. And again, this one, the square footage was a little bit bigger. This one has two full baths. So that's another thing to take into consideration. Ours had one full bath, one half bath. This one has a two car garage. So let's just see if there's anything particular about the pictures of this property that stand out. It's got that back back porch slash, slash deck, which ours won't have, uh, sunroom, whatever you would call that. Um, and it's renovated to the level that we would renovate ours. No real difference here. Yeah, ours is not gonna have this. So this, this property, it just has a bunch of little features that ours doesn't have which bump up the value. So this one is definitely way too high for sure. And this one sold at 485. The other one that sold at 455, ours is a pretty good comparable. The next thing that we want to look at as a data set is what we call the street scene. So in an ideal world, the easiest thing, the easiest way to find a comp for a property would be if you were able to find a comp for a property on the same exact street built by the same builder in the same condition, right? The reality is, is that that just never, ever happens, right? So it's completely impossible for that, almost completely impossible that that happens. But we do want to look at what's going on on the street. Because in a lot of cases, depending upon what street you're on, from one street to another, it can make a big difference, right? Even in the same neighborhood, sometimes there's a street that might just be a lot more desirable. So let's take a look. And the, the negative, by the way, with the street scene is that we're going back five years. So we do have to take into consideration where the market is at. So for example, like this property that sold in December of 2014 for, for, for 314,000, that was three years ago. So we really, we can only look at this as a data point, knowing that like projected out, this property might've sold for 375, just as an example. So we're looking, we're seeing stuff in the threes and the threes. Um, this property here, 78 Central, this one went under agreement in, this one just went under agreement, right? For 324. So what's the deal with this one? We've got to take you know a quick look to see um, three bags, one bath, spacious, completed with a fire. And this one looks good. So, oh, here we go. Part of it. Home and detached garage are being sold as is condition. So yeah, I mean that's just um, that's just another like you know from reading this, I would have thought that this, this was a retail sale, but there's going to be go there's something going on with this property that we really can't use. So 2015, 2013. Okay, here's a good one. Here's a real good one. Okay, so this one sold very recently. This one sold within the last few months. And this one sold at 379,000. This one was a ranch. This one has one and a half baths. This one had a living area of 1118. So this particular property right here, I actually wanna take a better look at because that one's on the same street. It's got the same square footage. And this one to me really actually should have been pulled in as a comp. Um, because it's got so many similarities to it and it's on the same street. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my MLS and that's 380 Central.
Jay wrote, do we always go with the right to the worst case scenario of 40K to replace the septic cost when determining rehab costs? Do we, do we try to get specific quotes on each septic design for each property? See, the, the problem with going for worst case scenarios in this market is that in a lot of cases, you're going to end up offering way too little. And again, there's not a problem when you're offering way too little and you get the deal. But the problem in this market as of you know, November 16th, 2017 is in most cases, you're going to get overbid and you're not going to get the deal. So it's a fine line. So what you really want to do and what I do is I'll lock up the deal, right? And in, in my contract, I'll say that the property has to pass Title V in order for me to buy it. But let's say that the seller says 100%, it won't pass. So I might put in there what my offer would be and then I'll put in there, I'm going to subtract out the cost of what the septic will cost to fix. And I'll let them get a few quotes, right? To make it, you know, completely fair. And we'll just verify that those quotes are correct. So the thing is with septic, septics specifically can be really tricky because they can go up to 40,000, but in some cases they can be just a few thousand dollars. And I don't want to get too much into like rehab talk but in some cases, you can also tie right in to the city, right? So you might be able to get the property on town sewer. And if you can get the property on town sewer for, say, $5,000, then that makes a big difference. In this particular case, we couldn't do that. So we did need to repair the septic. Um, and then Anthony just asked, let's see. Anthony said, can't you just get the price per square foot for the renovated one and use that price for yours or close? Um, that's a, that's another data point, right? So you can look at the price per square foot. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of that because the square footage can be deceiving. And the other problem is, is that sometimes people will list properties online at a wrong square footage. So they may list a, a thousand square foot property at 1300 square feet to try to attract more buyers. And then if I'm running my numbers based on that, um, it's not gonna come out to be accurate. So let's look at 380 Central. All right, so this one, again, this is on, a, on the same street. This is six months ago. Not a huge differential in prices between now and then. It's the same square footage. Odds are this property was probably built by the exact same builder as the one who bought our, who, who, bought, who um, built ours. That would be my guess. Let's just see if we can see the year that it was built. So this was built in 52, may not have been the same kind of attractive houses, but let's just look and see what this one looks like. Okay, so this is a good retail comp, right? So you look at this property, nothing wrong with it, no big negatives or anything like that, but it needs a little, I don't, needs is the wrong word. It, it definitely would benefit from some cosmetic work. So again, I'm still thinking this is just more, this is just more kind of fuel for my, my thinking that my ARV is more like 420. Because this house, somebody goes into this house, they think, okay, yeah, I've got to do some cosmetic work. I can move in, I can live here right away, but I'm not super, super excited about this property, right? So my, and what is this? The septic failed on this. Is that right? Oh, okay, septic system to be installed prior to closing. So it is going to have a brand new septic system. So that that is kind of irrelevant. I thought this was selling with the failed septic, which would have made it a big differential. But yeah, so mine, um, if this sold for 380, mine's going to look a lot nicer. At a minimum, mine is 410. It might be 415. It might be 420. It might be 425. You've always got to keep in mind with the after repair value, you can think that you're going to get 100% accuracy, but you never will. Because you never know how many buyers are going to be in the market 
at that particular time when you put the property on the market. You never know um, how people are going to exactly respond to the product that you put out there. Now, I know from looking at these pictures, like my property is going to be sold at a minimum of 400000 but I wouldn't be surprised if it was 430, right? And there, there can be that big of a, you know, of a swing. Yeah, and, th- and this, is, this is a good retail comp. This should have been the retail comp that was used. But anyways, we still got to this, we really still got to the same place. And so these are just, you know, other properties that sold on that street. But I, I like the one we just looked at so much that I'm not even gonna bother looking at the rest of these because that one was, that was the best comp possible to give us a determining factor as to what the value of ours is worth. Okay. So let's see if I can open the pictures of ours. What is the address of ours? 410 Central. And ours was listed on the MLS, I believe. So let me see if I can pull that up first. Okay. No, it wasn't. So it was just listed um, for sale by owner. I thought it, yeah, I thought it was listed at some point, but that's neither here nor there. Let's see if we can actually get to the pictures of this property. Uh, so they didn't put the photos in. I don't know why. Let's see if on the Zillow, because they had it listed as a FISBO, if there are pictures that we can see, just so that I can show you guys. All right, perfect. There's 14 pictures, so this makes life a lot, lot easier for us. And again, the, the, what we're looking at right now is our subject property. And, and here I am the whole time, you know, analyzing this deal, thinking that this is a thousand square feet. And up here, it's listed as three bed, two bath. So public record was wrong. When we looked at public record, it said three bags, one and a half baths, about a thousand square feet or 1100 square feet. So one of these is wrong. Either Zillow is wrong or, or public record is wrong. But I actually find more often that Zillow is actually more accurate. So let's take a look at these pictures. And look at that. Again, I'm running, I'm, I'm giving you guys here 50 minutes of analysis saying there's no garage. Keep in mind, I don't go inside any of these properties. I don't go out and I don't meet with the sellers and I don't go in there and renovate them. So here we go. We've got a we've got a little garage there. And as you can see, this property is pretty much in retail condition. Right? This is this is basically maybe a 4 out of 10. Right? This one's pretty dated but in solid condition. And look at that. Again, I'm telling you guys, it doesn't have this this sunroom off the back and it does. So now, given that I've seen this, right? I'm 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 going to have to go back on pretty much everything I said. We're probably looking at more like a 430 435 ARV, right? Because it does have some of these additional things and now I'm looking here and I'm like does this even have a finished basement here? Um but either either way, right? The thing about running these these deal analysis is like when you've got a good deal And we're just going to be conservative on this and say 430 now that I've seen these additional things. We're going to multiply that by 70%. Now, this house, right? Like, I'm going to put in a budget of 20,000 because that's the average. 20,000 is the average for the septic when we fix it. And I'm going to put in a $40,000 renovation budget for the house because the house is actually in pretty decent shape. 
So when I subtract that out to get to the 60,000, and I've got a budget calculator for you guys if you ever need it, and it's completely idiot proof because I don't know anything about renovating homes, like the actual construction. So if you go to Ocean City Budget, you can actually put together a budget based on about 15 different data sets. So does it need hardwoods? Like, let's, let's actually just run this for practice really quick, right? So this one did not need hardwoods. Um, it probably doesn't need plumbing. Um, I'm going to go with exterior paint, although that's 50-50. I'm going to put carpet, not exterior siding, not windows. I'm going to put landscaping, interior paint, appliances, roof. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to put in there to be just conservative. Uh, bath one, bath two, kitchen. Uh, I'm going to guess it doesn't need a lot of electrical work, but I'm going to put that in anyways. Hardwood floors looked really good, and I'm going to put a buffer in there, right, to get to get me out to 38500 Like I mentioned, we put in there uh, $20,000 for the septic. And, I, you know, again, I'm just calling this 60000 to get to my offer of two forty one. And again, let's just confirm what I paid here since half the information I've given you guys is like 90% accurate. I want to get 100% accuracy here on this, at least this last piece of information. Okay, so we paid 249, right? So we were basically right at 70% of ARV minus repairs. And again, could this property sell for 235, uh, 435? Yes. Could it sell for 440? Yes. Could it sell for 420? Yes. Could the renovation budget be a little bit lower? I think the, the renovation budget actually will be a little bit lower, like I had put in there. I put a couple of buffers. I put that it needed a roof when I, I'm, I'm not sure that it does. So as you can see, when, when you're talking about like a net profit on the type of deals like this, at the end of the day, like you're never going to get 100% accuracy and we're in pretty good shape based on this one. So I feel really comfortable with this one. And the other thing to keep in mind, just if you're out there making offers on properties is we paid 249 for this. If you guys remember, there was a comp right at the beginning of this uh, analysis. Somebody paid 300 for a property that was basically in the same exact condition as ours with the septic that needed to be done as well. So we theoretically could probably sell this for $300,000 if we just turned around tomorrow and wanted to basically wholesale it or wholesale it, depending upon if we, we might not even do anything to it. Like this one, 121 Willow. I'm just going to take a quick look. This one sold for 310 actually. So for those of you who are thinking about wholesaling deals, you can look and see how much potential margin there is on these. I mean, this property looks like almost an exact replica of ours. Condition, size of the home, all that good stuff. So theoretically, and I'm sure an investor bought this one, theoretically, you should be able to come in and if you're going to wholesale this or wholetail it, make $30,000, $40,000, which almost makes a renovation on this property not even that exciting. We are going to renovate this. And one of the things that we always need to keep in mind is we've got to keep our contractors busy, especially throughout the winter. And we're in November right now, kind of the slow season for a lot of them. So um so we're renovating this property no matter what, but if you're out there considering wholesaling deals, man, there's no better market to wholesale a deal in. I mean, you could have easily made $25,000, $35,000 on this deal just wholesaling it, okay? So I, I, I'm kind of wrapped up, wrapped up with this particular deal. Does anybody else have any other questions? And it doesn't necessarily have to be just on analyzing deals. It can be really on anything else, real estate investing related. Um, I'm happy to stay for as long as everybody needs me. Um, but if, if everything kind of makes sense and nobody needs anything else, I mean, I can, I can just wrap it up. So I apologize for my computer running a little bit slow. Um, it definitely threw me off a little bit during some of this and I really don't know what's going on. I think I probably just need to get, get a new updated computer, but, um, but yeah, so I mean, there's definitely tons of money to be made right now in real estate for sure. 
um, all of the stuff, you know, just analyzing this deal just goes to show, right? Like this person wanted literally $150,000 more than what the property ended up selling to me for, right? So never, never get too, too crazy about a seller's asking price. Um, and as you saw on this one, like if you, if you remember when we looked through the notes in the very beginning of the, of the call, like the person wanted 394, we bought it for 250. But the thing to keep in mind with that is like, they probably thought it was worth 394 on day one. And then they maybe met with an investor or two or met with a real estate agent. And that number kept getting knocked down and knocked down and knocked down. And they had it for sale by owner on Zillow and they were probably getting no interest. So in a lot of cases, we buy our properties like the second that we go out and meet with a seller, we go out, we make an offer, we sign a contract that day or the next day. But it's not uncommon for a deal like this where the seller really tests out the market first um, to see what they can get. And then the market feedback tells them, man, yeah, your property isn't worth 394. And clearly in this case, I don't even know where they got 394 because I'm going to fully renovate it and hope to get 425, 430, 435. But, um, but yeah, they just needed to be knocked down, you know, back to reality. And they did get knocked down back to reality. Who knows? I could probably figure out how long they had it for sale by owner before selling to us, but it was probably a good, decent amount of time. So, so anyways, I don't see any additional questions coming in every Thursday. We've got training every single day, literally every single day, Monday through Friday, we've got multiple training sessions, um, on different topics every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. It's the deal analysis. I'd love to have you guys bring on some of your deals. I know we've got a bunch of people um, that are on right now that um, have deals, have have face-to-face -face appointments that I'd love to analyze. I've got no issue analyzing mine, but um, it's actually easier for you guys uh, if, if you guys need, need help. So if you look at our training calendar, um, www.oceancity, what is it? I forget the URL. It's a, it's a forward oceancityweeklytraining.com. It'll take you to this URL here. And as you can see, we've got multiple sessions every single day. So the only day we don't have two sessions is today. Every other day, we've got multiple sessions. And we're actually, believe it or not, going to be adding to this. This is all free, guys. So all that you need to do to sign up for this is literally just go to these the Zoom URLs, click on the link and register. And like you're on this call today, you'll be able to jump on one of one of these calls. And um, you don't need to sign up for all of them. So if there's a topic that you need help with, like today for the people who jumped on, probably felt like they needed a little bit help with valuation. Um, if you need help with technology, if you need help with face-to-face -face seller appointments, if you wanna learn how to generate uh, buyer leads from your investment deals, Whatever you guys need help with, like this training is it's all live. It's all free. Definitely hop on. And we're going to be adding more to this. So I appreciate everybody who jumped on and had questions. Um, and for those of you who didn't, just let me know what else you guys need help with. We're here to, we're here to help you guys. So thank you for, um, for jumping on and I'll see you guys. Well, I'll see you. I will see you guys tomorrow because I'm live again tomorrow, but um, I'll probably see the people who are interested in valuations on next Thursday. So thanks again.